scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Nahum. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. This is the word of the Lord. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. And the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an, ever, with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and pro- will pursue his enemies into darkness. What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble, fully dried. From one came one, from you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off you and will burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given commandment about you. No more shall your name be perpetuated. From the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave, for you are vile. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Please join me in prayer. Father, as uh, we open up your word this morning, I would pray that as uh, we interact with it, you speak to us, that uh, we are challenged and encouraged by what we read. Guide and direct my words this morning. And may you be glorified during this time. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You might be thinking, well, that's surely an encouraging passage this morning. (sighs) Gives you a warm fuzzy as we approach the holiday season. So you may be asking, who And more importantly, why? Who is Nahum and why should we study him? Well, this little book situated amidst the 12 minor prophets is a a great study about the goodness and holiness of God and is worthy of our attention Many of us have studied and have heard the account of Jonah. 
and how Jonah, when God wanted him to go to Nineveh, he decided to go the other way. And we remember all that has happened to him. And, and even as he walked the city for three days, according to Jonah 3 2, saying nothing more than, in a little while, everything's going to be toast. And the nation had repented. And now we come 150 years later and Nineveh is now going to be judged. And God uses this, this prophet Nahum whose name means comfort to give a scathing message to those who rebel against God and yet at the same time to say to God's people that the Lord is good. But he is devastating in his goodness. And our passage before us this morning is going to show us that God's goodness to his people is demonstrated as he executes judgment on those who oppose him. In the first two verses, we're going to see that God is jealous. He's jealous for those who belong to him. In verse 3 through 6, we're going to see that God's goodness doesn't mean that he doesn't judge. In verses 7 through 11, we're going to see that God's goodness is measured by his holiness. And in verses 12 through 14, we're going to see God's goodness demonstrated so that it demonstrates that he is sovereign. A little bit about Nahum and a little bit about Nineveh is in order. What we know about Nahum is only about what he says about himself, that he is from Elkosh. We don't know if that's a family name or if that's an area. The location of where he lived is up to speculation. His name means comfort. And uh, there are some scholars who have thought that... Uh, he lived in a, what is called, uh, literally a village of comfort. The village of comfort. In Greek, or the Hebrew of it first is Kapernaum. Village of comfort. In the New Testament, Kapernaum means, is translated Capernaum where Jesus was headquartered. Nahum is writing his prophecy around 650 B.C. Other than that, we don't know a lot about Nahum. Now, we know a lot about Nineveh. When I was in college, I remember going to this movie some of you who are a little older might remember this movie. It's a movie in which King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table are heading in search of a holy grail. And they come to a bridge and there's a troll. And the, the troll has three questions. What is your name? What is your quest? And then the troll throws in this little oddball question that if they don't know it, they, the knights perish. And so one of them, I was so excited to see this as a college student. What is your name? What is your quest? What 
is the capital of Assyria. And I said in the theater, Nineveh! <laughs> Unfortunately, the knight didn't know that. And of course, and there was another one that didn't know what his favorite color was or the airspeed velocity of a European swallow. But I, I knew that the capital of Assyria was Nineveh. Nineveh was established, according to Genesis 10, by Nimrod, located on the east bank of the Tigris River. The Tigris River acted as the western and southern boundaries of the city. There was a wall that extended for eight miles, forming the northern and eastern boundaries. The city was three miles long, uh, eight miles long, excuse me, three miles wide inside the walls. There were suburbs that extended 14 miles to the north and 20 miles to the south. And at one point, it was the largest city in the world. And, and Jonah had to spend three days to walk across Nineveh. Nineveh's leaders built canals to bring water to the city. We're going to find out that those walls were breached and those rivers flooded in fulfillment of Nineveh chapter 1, verse 8. Of course, and Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. It was one of the great world powers. And they were known for their viciousness. And 150 years had passed from the time of Jonah to the time of Nahum. And so when we read in Nahum verse 1, verses 1 and 2, an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Alkosh, that oracle, that burden is God saying, I have had enough. That word oracle is used to refer to uh, when they were packing uh, a mule, loading stuff up. Everything's been piling up against Nineveh, and God has had enough. We read in verse 2 that the Lord is jealous and avenging. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Now the original readers of this in Hebrew would see that this is a poem. It is a, an acrostic poem in which the first word in each verse begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and then the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet and go on. So they, this is something that they would see and remember as an acrostic poem. God is jealous. We think of jealousy as being something very negative. Jealous of the person that has the Mercedes. Jealous of the person that has the big house. But God is jealous. And the great thing is, is that he is jealous for his people. He's jealous for me and for you. He's jealous for our protection. He is jealous for in his holiness to judge his enemies. He is jealous and avenging. Notice there, it's not revenging. Now, I haven't watched the movies of, of the Marvel comics or anything, but I do know that there is a popular series of superheroes called the, the Avengers. They're not taking revenge. You know, revenge is 
you do this to me, I do the same thing to you. What is avenge? You do this to me, and I squash you like a cockroach. He's taking vengeance on his adversaries. He is keeping and holding wrath until the appropriate time for his enemies. Thank the Lord that we are no longer enemies of God. Can you imagine being the enemy of God? But God is jealous for his people to protect us and to execute righteousness and holiness. We read in verse 3 and 4 that the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. He's slow to anger. In Hebrew, literally, it means... He is long of nose. With the idea of, of, of nostrils flaring up, God is slow to anger. He is great in power. But too many of us in this world believe that if he is slow to anger and if he is seemingly not doing anything, then maybe it's no big deal. Unless we see swift action, we think... Voice, he must have blown it off. It didn't rise to the level of getting his attention. No, the Lord is slow to anger. He's great in power, and he will by no means clear the guilty. And while the scripture tells us over and over, for instance, like in Exodus 34, 6, when the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He is still holy and he will execute wrath to his enemies. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. The Lord is marching out for battle. And the word that is translated rebuke here is likened to a, a battle cry shouted by a, a warrior to strike fear into the enemy. He is announcing, I am coming after you. I'm coming after you. Nahum is saying that God's patience with Nineveh has come to an end. Remember that Nahum was writing about 630 B.C. 650, 630 B.C. And yet he is saying, the Lord is coming after you. His way is in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. His way is quick, unexpected, and quick, and certain. 
every spring, the Assyrians would uh, wait until the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers would dry up. And then they would cross and go out to war. God isn't going to wait for spring. He's going to execute judgment when he desires. And he is able to part the rivers and to attack Assyria. We read about Bashan and Carmel withering. Bashan was a fertile and stoneless plain that extended from Mount Hermon to Gilead. Imagine a a fertile and stoneless plain. Just beautiful, peaceful, wonderful. It was uh, noted for being rich pasture land and, and livestock was uh, were very well suited to uh, the graze there. God says it's going to wither. Carmel was a mountain range with a beautiful garden-like appearance. You can picture your favorite spot in your favorite mountain area, whether it be the mountains of Colorado or the in the mountains of Tennessee or in the Appalachians, a mountain range with a beautiful garden, it withers as well. See, Carmel was known as a figure of beauty. That's why Solomon addresses his bride in the Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 5, saying that your head crowns you like Carmel. Not caramel, caramel. Your flowing locks are like purple. A king is held captive in the tresses. And of course, that's why he says that his bride's hair is like a flock of goats descending down the mountain. But God is going to wither those away. The the bloom of Lebanon is withering as well. God is going to act and he's going to judge. Verses 5 and 6, the mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. And then Nahum asks a few rhetorical questions. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? And the answer, of course, is nobody. Because his wrath is being poured out like fire. And the rocks are being broken and shattered into pieces by him. See, God's goodness doesn't mean that he will not judge sin. But God's goodness, as he, judges according, uh, as he judges sin, is also measured against the attribute of the attributes. His holiness. Look at Nahum chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Now, depending on whether or not you're an enemy of God or not, you will either feel encouraged or scared. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Why is that? Because he has chosen them. He's chosen us. Psalm 27, verse 1 tells us, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. 
of whom shall I be afraid? If you're not the enemy of God this morning, that God has drawn you to himself in Jesus Christ, he is good. He is a stronghold. He is a place of security in the day of uncertainty, in the day of trouble. But he will judge. With an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries. An overflowing flood. And it just happens that Nineveh and being conquered by the Babylonians and others, breached the wall and caused those rivers to flood. We read in verse 9 through 11, what do you plot against the Lord? And I think the rhetorical question is, not much. Certainly nothing that surprises him. But he will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise a second time. The reason why trouble will not rise a second time is because God is going to take care of it the first time. For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble, fully dried. From you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Entangled thorns are, are tough to uh, penetrate, aren't they? But the, you know, they're no match for fire. And likewise, uh, Nineveh, as consumed and confused as they are, they are consumed with alcohol like drunkards as they drink and as confused as they would be when their city is under attack. They would be no match for God's wrath, the consuming fire of God's wrath. And the Lord would destroy them as easily and quickly as the fire burned up the dead stalks left in the fields after harvest. They are consumed like stubble, fully dried. God's anger is directed against Nineveh and its pagan king who deliberately plotted to destroy the people. We read in verse 11, from you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. To kind of understand the context of this, we have to go back to Isaiah chapter 36. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And this occurs around 700 B.C. And, uh, you know, these guys uh, like to write a lot about themselves and um, one of the fun parts of history is that we can go and see their writings. They put them on stone. Uh, Sennacherib has his writings in, on a prism. And it's, it's actually located in the British Museum. And it's always interesting to me to, to hear what they were thinking. And I'd like to read for you just a bit of that. As to Hezekiah the Jew, 
He did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to 46 of his strong cities, walled forts into the countless, countless small villages in their vicinity, and conquered them by means of well-stamped earth ramps and battering rams brought thus near to the walls, combined with the attack by foot soldiers, using mines, breaches, as well as sapper work, I drove out of them 200,150 people, young and old, male and female, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, big and small cattle beyond counting, and considered them booty. Himself, I made, himself referring to uh, Hezekiah, himself, I made a prisoner in Jerusalem his royal residence like a bird in a cage. I surrounded him with earthwork in order to molest those who were leaving his city's gate. He also brought with him to his royal residence in order to strengthen it um, Hezekiah sends to him 30 talents of gold, 800 talents of silver, precious stones, large cuts of red stone, uh, ivory, uh, inlaid chairs with ivory, elephant hides, ebony wood, boxwood, all kinds of valuable treasures. Hezekiah even sent his daughters, concubines, male and female musicians in order to deliver the tribute and the due obedience, obedience as a slave he sent his personal messenger. Sennacherib, king of the world, king of Assyria, sat upon a throne and passed in review the booty taken from Lachish. And the quote Lee Corso, not so fast. God is saying, not so fast. Days coming when God will judge. We read in verses 12 and 13 of Nahum that God's goodness demonstrates his sovereignty. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off you and will Burst your bonds apart. God is directing some words to his people. Even though Nineveh is at full strength, then there are many. They're going to be cut down, they're going to be eliminated. And I'm going to break his yoke off of you and burst the bonds. I will afflict you no more. In Isaiah 37, verses 26 through 29, the Lord answers Hezekiah's prayer and addresses Sennacherib this is uh, God's word from Isaiah 37, verse 26. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass. That you should make fortified cities crash into a heap of ruins while their inhabitants shorn of strength are dismayed and confounded and become like the plants of the field and like tender grass 
like grass on the housetops, blighted before it is grown. I know you're sitting down and you're going out and coming in. And you're raging against me. Because you've raged against me and your complacency has come to my ears. And this is interesting here in Isaiah 37, 29. I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. And that is what God did. In verse 14, we see another demonstration of his sovereignty. The Lord has given commandment about you, Nineveh. No more shall your name be perpetuated. From the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave because you are vile. And we read in 2 Kings exactly that about what happened. 2 Kings 19, verse 32 through 37. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. Now, Sennacherib had been dead. And so he's referring to an event that occurred in 612 when the Babylonians and the Medes conquered Nineveh. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. And that night... The angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people rose early in the morning, behold, they were all, these, there were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived at Nineveh. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrash, his god, two of his sons struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. And his son, Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place. So Sennacherib was judged. And in 612 BC, Nineveh is ultimately destroyed. Well, how, do all, how does all this kind of relate to us? I'd like to offer a couple of applications. First, God's people are assured of encouragement and comfort in this passage. Affliction that we endure doesn't go unnoticed. There will be a final accounting. Secondly, uh, we can't presume that God's patience is endless. The temporary withholding of his wrath shouldn't be misunderstood as the laying aside of that wrath. Thirdly, uh, we need to examine our hearts to confirm and to see whether we're an enemy of God or not an enemy of God. It would be pretty scary if you were here this morning and you were an enemy of God to know that you would, might fall into the hands of a, a wrathful and avenging God because of sin. God demonstrates his love for us 
that while we were sinners and while we were enemies of God, he sent his son to die on a cross for you in order that you might be declared righteous before him. Lastly, I think this passage reminds us that although the the wrong seems so prevalent, God is still the ruler. God is still in control. He is in control of the destiny of all nations. No matter how powerful, no matter how untouchable, the wicked may seem. Nahum reminds us this morning that God's hand is active and he is working even in the darkest of times. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message from your word. These words from Nahum that comfort us, that uh, encourage us. We thank you that you are sovereign, that you are in control, and that uh, once we were dead in our sins, but you called us to yourself. And this morning we can praise you for being good. We can praise you for being just and righteous and sovereign. As you add your blessing to the reading of your word and from my words this morning, I pray these things in Jesus' name.